Hello and welcome to this video covering the anatomy of the skull. We're going to take quite a detailed look at the skull in this video, but we're going to kick things off by taking a look at the individual skull bones. I've put the legend in the bottom left hand corner so you can pause the video at any stage and take a bit more of a detailed look. Looking anteriorly at the skull, we can see individual bones. The blue bone at the top is the frontal bone. The green one in the middle is the maxilla. The purple one is the mandible. Turning the skull laterally now, we can see more of the yellow bone, which is the zygoma, and that's continuous with the zygomatic arch, and you can see that turns pink. That's the temporal bone. We can see the blue bone at the top. There's a sutural line that joins that with the bone posteriorly. That is the parietal bone, and we can see number seven there, which is the sphenoid bone. So there are two parts to the skull. One is the calvarium which is the skull cap and we can remove that and that allows us to look inside the skull which we shall do in due course and we have the facial skeleton so the facial skeleton is what we've just been talking about in terms of that particular view which is anterior so if we look closely at the orbit we can see the orbit is actually very complex it's made up of a number of different bones here is the opening of the optic canal that's a big hole in the skull where the optic nerve travels through and if you want to study the orbit in a bit more detail you can see the graphic coming on screen now and uh, pause the video at this stage and look at the individual bones that make up the skull and also the key foramina that are involved we've talked about the optic canal but there are some others in red here including the superior orbital fissure we've got the inferior orbital fissure and we've got just underneath the orbit we've got the infraorbital foramen as well so let's take a look at a couple of these on the actual skull we saw the optic canal earlier now we get a better view of that big hole there that's the superior orbital fissure and coming on your screen now, if I just tilt the skull, I've slowed this down a little bit, but you should be able to see on the floor of the orbit there, that's the inferior orbital fissure. So they are the main foramina of the orbit. Now we can take a look at a more superior view, looking at some of the sutures. What we can see now as we turn the skull and look at it, from a position above we can see the sagittal suture the one in front is the coronal suture as we look posteriorly we can see the join between that big parietal bone in orange and the blue bone which is the occipital bone which we haven't seen yet and if as we turn it laterally coming on right there is the h-shaped configuration called the terion now that's really clinically important because of its relationship with the middle meningeal artery so as we look at a lateral view when we see the terion there we can point out some structures that we can see one of the structures that i'm going to point out right now is the temporomandibular joint this is an interesting little joint because it has a number of movements and two joint capsules there we've got the ramus of the mandible and that's the angle of the mandible and we can point out the zygomatic arch made up of the temporal bone and the zygoma so as we turn the skull anteriorly again, we can get another view of the infraorbital foramen in the maxilla. We can now see in the lacrimal bone, we can see the nasolacrimal duct. That's where tears drain into the nose. And that's the reason why our nose runs when we cry is because tears drain into the nose. We're going to point out some really important spaces here. Here we've got the temporal fossa. That's above the zygomatic arch. There's another space that we need to know which is inferior to the zygomatic arch. We've just moved the mandible here. This is known as the infratemporal fossa. So that's an important region as well to remember. And within the infratemporal fossa, we have a small teardropped shaped space. And it's just in there. That's called the pterygopalatine fossa. That's really, really important. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. So this will be a good time to bring in a graphic. You can see quite a detailed representation of the pterygopalatine fossa. And there's a lot going on there, but the main take home message here is that it contains the pterygopalatine ganglia, which is a parasympathetic ganglia associated with the facial nerve. And it receives preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. And they synapse at this ganglion, the postganglionic fibers leave, 
and they are destined for the oral cavity, the nasal cavity and also the lacrimal gland. We can also see that there are sympathetics that run through that space. We can see that there are a number of blood vessels too. So we are going to move on now and take a look at a slightly different view. This is a superior view looking down on the skull with the calvarium removed. So we are going to zoom in on this section and run through some of the individual regions of the skull as seen from this view. So looking at this view now, we can see the big blue bone again, that's the frontal bone and that's the roof of the orbit. In the center of there is the ethmoid bone and that's the cribriform plate. What I'm marking out now is the border of the anterior cranial fossa. I'm going round the lesser wing of the sphenoid here and we can see we can complete that journey as we mark out the anterior cranial fossa. Now we're going to move posteriorly and we're going to look at the second cranial fossa here. We are looking at the middle cranial fossa here. So I'm going to mark that out as well. We're going to take that border of the sphenoid bone going all the way round and I'm running across the petrous part of the temporal bone there all the way back to complete that journey. That's the middle cranial fossa. So the bones that make up the middle cranial fossa would be the greater wing of the sphenoid, the temporal bone, both the squamous parts and the petrous part and the parietal bone. As we tip the skull here, we can see the last of the cranial fossae. This is the posterior cranial fossae, and we can see it's made up mostly of this blue bone. The occipital bone's got a big hole in it where there's the journey of the spinal cord becoming the medulla oblongata. And we're marking it out now. We can see the posterior cranial fossa there made up of the petrous part of the temporal bone, the parietal bone and the occipital bone. So now we're going to take the opportunity to revisit each of the cranial fossae and look at the individual foramina, the holes in the skull in each of those areas. So let's first address those that are in the anterior cranial fossa. This is the cribriform plate. This is where the olfactory nerves travel. And that's the only one really to consider in the anterior cranial fossa. Now we're going to move on to the middle. We can see here the optic canals. We saw these earlier from an anterior view. That's where the optic nerves travel. If we tilt the skull now to look at the greater wing of the sphenoid, we can see quite a large space. That's called the superior orbital fissure. And traveling through there would be the trochlear nerve, the ocular motor nerve, and the abducens nerve. And of course, the ophthalmic nerve. As we journey more posteriorly in the greater wing of the sphenoid, we come to the foramen rotundum that transmits V2, which is the maxillary division of trigeminal. Tilting the skull slightly to see the next one posteriorly is foramen ovale that transmits V3. That's the mandibular division of trigeminal. And just lateral to that is a much smaller foramen, which is called foramen spinosum. And this foramen spinosum transmits a branch of the maxillary artery, which is called the middle meningeal artery. And you can see here that it leaves an impression in the skull, which travels over the region of the skull known as the terion. So the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery travels over that region. And that's clinically important because it can cause an extradural hematoma. I'm pointing out foramen lacerum, which is filled with a cartilage plug in life and nothing passes through there, but it does represent a change of direction for the internal carotid artery, which when it reaches that point, travels vertically up into the cavernous sinus. So now we're going to look at a foramen which actually isn't represented on this skull. There's no hole here because it's a plastic skull. And what we're going to point out here with a graphic is the position of both the left and right internal acoustic meatus. This is for the transmission of the vestibular cochlear nerve and the facial nerve, but it's not present here. And that's in the posterior wall of the petrous part of the temporal bone. So now we're going back into the posterior cranial fossa and we need to tip the skull in order to see some of these foramina. There's a large one coming up here, which is going to be the jugular foramen, which we can see here 
just right there. So this is quite a large space because it's the origin of the internal jugular vein. You can see that the sigmoid sinus is a groove there that drains into it. But passing through there, we would also find the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve and the accessory nerve. Just tucked in here, it's slightly dark. We can see a space for the hypoglossal nerve. That's going to be the hypoglossal canal. So that concludes that view. So now we need to turn the skull over and we can look at the inferior skull or the skull base as it's known because there's a couple of bones and a couple of spaces here that we can't see from a superior view. So we need to look at those now. We can kick things off by looking at the undersurface of the maxilla and the palatine bone, which make up the hard palate. Inside the palatine bone, we see two holes, the greater palatine foramina and the lesser palatine foramina. They transmit small nerves and blood vessels. One of the key things I want to point out from this view is the carotid canal. This is the entry point into the skull for the internal carotid artery. It's a small tunnel that leads into the skull. Over on the lateral side, there's a couple of other things that uh, we need to talk about. First of all, we've got the styloid process, which is for muscle attachments, and we've got the mastoid process on the lateral side, both belonging to the temporal bone. Also at the back here, we can see two holes. These are the condylar foramina. Uh, they're not to be confused with the hyperglossal canal, which I'm poking my little stick through there. The condylar canal is not too important. It really is just for transmitting some small emissary veins. So there we have it. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help explain the mysteries of the brain.